Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, your host here tonight at The Real Science Exchange. Tonight, we get to dive into the exciting world of performance horses. This arena has grown tremendously over the last decade, and our guests tonight have been leading the way. Joining us at the pub tonight, we have three of the experts in equine nutrition who are helping shape the future of nutrition management. Tonight's pubcast stories are brought to you by the Keisher line of chelated minerals. Keisher and Keisher Plus deliver proven and consistent bioavailability to maximize performance and a no-frills pricing approach for greater profitability. Visit balchem.com to learn more. Dr. Pagan, uh, we'll start with you. Uh, thanks for joining us here at the Exchange. Um, you completed a webinar for us back in August, and you shared some very interesting aspects of feeding for performance. Um, so we're excited to be able to go into a deeper look at that tonight. But before we do, um, can you tell us what's in your glass tonight? Well, Scott, um, all three of us tonight uh, live in the great state of Kentucky, horse capital of the world. Steve and I live in Woodford County. And Woodford County is kind of uh, renowned for its ability to produce bourbon. So tonight I have Woodford Reserve, which is awesome. a fitting thing to, for I think, for us to drink being from Kentucky. Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorites uh, and one of my old standbys here. So I'm going to assume it is made there in Woodford County. It is. All right. Super. Um, Joe, uh, would you mind introducing your uh, guest tonight and tell us a little bit about how you got to know each other? Oh, geez, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I have known uh, Steve Jackson and Laurie Lawrence for well over 30 years, 35, maybe it's coming up on 40 years. And it's interesting because we're actually from the same generation of equine nutritionists. <clears throat> it's, it's interesting because equine nutrition research used to be a really big deal back in the 1800s, early 1900s. Then after uh, that, the tractor was invented and they quit studying horses because it wasn't really important for animal traction. And the, the discipline really disappeared for several decades. Back in the 60s and the 70s, uh, there was sort of a resurgence of that where there were more pleasure horses, performance horses. And so universities decided to start studying equine nutrition again. And they recruited... Uh, scientists who hadn't been trained in equine nutrition uh, to start to train equine nutritionists. And so I'm of that first generation, as is Laurie and Steve. Uh, you might refer to us as the greatest generation or more appropriately, the gray beards and blue hairs now. So we're the first generation and that's how I, I know both of them is because we kind of came up at a at approximately the same time and literally were the first group that was actually trained to be equine nutritionists. There's two or three generations since then. And in fact, I just hired one of Laurie's uh, recent PhD graduates. So that would be a second generation. And there's even third generation researchers. So we go way, way back. Well, that's, that's uh, very interesting. Uh, Laurie, let's start with you now. How did you, uh, do you remember when you first met Joe? I do. Um, we were at a research meeting. I think it might've been in Las Vegas. Um, it was a sports medicine conference and he was um, giving a paper there and I was there to learn. And uh, he was a graduate student at the time. And I remember um, after he was having a discussion with one of the other people who, were there, who was there, a fellow by the name of David Lambert. Um, David Lambert turned to me and he said, that guy's really sharp, isn't he? So that was where I met Joe. Okay. Now I understand you're both Cornelians and I thought perhaps you had met there. No, I, I predated him by a bit. Okay. All right. Very well. Lori, what's in your glass tonight? Well, I've got some uh, ale in my glass and I'm uh, using a um, glass that I got from the Red Mile when they had their 140th year uh, celebration. And so, um, we as horse owners have both thoroughbreds and standard breds. And um, so I thought it was appropriate to uh, have my glass from the Red Mile. Yeah, excellent. And Steve, how did you first meet Joe? 
Uh, same way, ENPS, it was called at that point, the Equine Nutrition Physiology Society. And Joe and I are actually uh, probably exactly the same in terms of our graduate work. Uh, I was at University of Kentucky and had a major professor, John Baker, who, like uh, Joe's major professor, uh, Dr. Hentz, uh, was kind of the the ones that they identified to kind of uh, create a resurgence in equine nutrition. So Joe and I were at numerous um, meetings together and uh, I taught at the University of Kentucky and left there in September of 90 to uh, join Joe in uh, developing Kentucky, uh, uh, I, 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 Kentucky Equine Nutrition, I started to say Bluegrass Equine Nutrition. But, and then uh, one of the things that I, I think is one of the best achievements of my life is before I left, uh, ensuring that they were going to hire Laurie Lawrence to take my position. So I've got a tremendous amount of respect uh, for both Joe and Laurie. And, uh, you know, they, they tend to be the scientific leaders and uh, since I left uh, KER and started Bluegrass uh, Equine Nutrition, I, I do more consulting on farm work, management, actual involvement in all aspects of, of mainly thoroughbred farms. Very well. So we've certainly uh, assembled a star studded team, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. But before we do, I'd like to uh, introduce my co host for tonight's conversation. Uh, uh, Carrie Estes, Carrie's joined us for a few special segments, and I'm excited to have her back here at the pub once again. So welcome back, Carrie, and what's in your glass tonight? Any bourbon? No. Okay. <laughs> if you know me, Scott, I am not a big drinker, <laughs> and I do have to attend a conference here in a few hours, so I've just got water in my glass. All right, very well, I understand. <laughs> so, Joe, to get us started, can you give us a brief overview of Kentucky Equine Research? and your facilities there, and, 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 and what do you do there? Sure, well, Kentucky Equine Research is a private company, number one, which is often we are confused as being uh, part of a university. Um, KER, again, was started in 1988, and it's, it's kind of interesting how it started because I, as we've already discussed, I went to Cornell uh, for my graduate um, studies, and it was at a time at Cornell when there was a great group of people there, Peter Van Seust and Dale Bauman, and lots of these guys were churning out all sorts of great science. And Skip Hintz was my major professor, was kind of the, the one of the leaders in this new resurgent equine nutritionist. And I was, I was trained there and assumed that what you did for a living was you went to a university. So when I graduated from uh, Cornell, I did not have a commercial bone in my body. Uh, that was not something that I would have even contemplated. But as as fate would have it, there weren't academic positions when I graduated and I ended up in the feed industry. And it was serendipity, really, because I, it kind of opened my eyes to the, the great new world of uh, what was happening in equine nutrition. And so the application of research became a lot more important to me. It was uh, it was how can you find new things, but also how can you apply them? So after a few years in the American feed industry, uh, I started KER, but its mission was increase the knowledge of uh, the, the horse industry, but also apply that knowledge. And so really KER was Pat, do research. So we have quite a, a large research facility, both in Kentucky and in Florida, but also always be thinking about the application of that information. So we really refer to KER as an innovation company. We're trying to find new and improve. Uh, sure, we have to, to take care of what's going on right now, but really what we're looking for is what is, is next in line. And I think, you know, uh, Steve and I obviously uh, have known each other very well for a long time. And I think really our philosophies about what we're wanting to do is a little different in that he has to take care of business every day. There are horses out there that are being raised today. 
um, and racehorses that are being trained today. And so, Steve, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your focus is is a little more on what is happening now and how to make it done correctly and have the best result where we do that at KER, but we also kind of have the luxury of looking ahead. It's like, what new things can we try um, to develop? Mm -hmm. Steve, that's a great segue. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your practice now? Okay. Um, you know, we live right in the center of, of uh, the thoroughbred industry. It's kind of the mecca for thoroughbreds. And uh, prior to the time that I left KER, I was doing a lot of on-farm consultation. And it, it's not only what to feed, but how to feed it. And a lot of times when we get into wrecks, um, it's not the feed, it's the feeding management that we need to look at. So I, I had lots and lots more clients uh, uh, in the thoroughbred industry. And, and so I decided that, you know, I, I grew up around horses. I showed horses. I rodeoed as a, as a teenager and up through college. And uh, so I, I'm intensely involved with uh, grassroots horses and uh, I think that's one of the things that maybe has made uh, my business somewhat successful is that uh, horsemanship, because I raise horses myself, I sell horses, I raise race horses, and so I'm very involved in the industry. And what I found was that it, a lot of times the information that 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 uh, consumers receive is may be correct commercially but when you put it on a farm basis it really doesn't get the job done in terms of of raising a racehorse or a, a performance horse of any kind or a halter horse as, as far as that's concerned so um i'm busy busy uh internationally in japan and ireland and england and france and australia uh, with clients as well as clients in central kentucky trying to interpret apply uh, the things that Joe and Laurie uh, work at uh, every day, you know, is to, to take the research to, to the farm. And it's a good, it's a, it, it's kind of one of those deals that if I won the lottery, I'd probably do this for free. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about um, not specific clients, but the, the types of clients that you uh, consult for? Uh, most of my clients, tend to be uh, upper end uh, thoroughbred owners, either trainers or farm owners, uh, all of them. And, and interestingly, uh, most of them have become good friends, uh, the, the actual owner of the farm, as well as the management of the farm. So, you know, we're talking about larger farms in central Kentucky and a couple of farms in Japan and in Ireland and you know, it, it's uh, it's really been a, a fun deal because you feel very connected uh, to horses and what they're achieving right now. For instance, this year, the 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 odds on favorite uh, for the Breeders' Cup Classic is Flightline. And he was bred by one of my clients uh, that retained 25 percent. So I've been watching going to most of his races. And so. You feel a, a closer relationship to thinking that you had something to do with these horses achieving what they do. Although maybe sometimes that's false. I, I, I think good horses sometimes are just a freak of nature. And we're all, all doing things, all reading from the same book. You know, it, any of us that are making feed or are or, or making recommendations to people, we're reading from the same book. So there's not that much difference uh, in what people do. So it's the management in general and matings. I do a lot with matings of stallions to mares and uh, just the total involvement in the thoroughbred business, mainly. All right. Very good. Lori, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the work that you're doing there at the University of Kentucky? Sure. I'm a professor in the Department of Animal and Food Sciences which is a great place for an equine nutritionist because we have a number of other nutritionists who work with other species. So I often think, as Joe said, uh, a lot of us were trained, um, sort of cross-trained, our 
our most of our lectures probably didn't have a lot to do with horse nutrition, but we learned a lot about the basics of nutrition. And so um, that's always a principle that I've tried to um, pass on to my graduate students that they need to be nutritionists first um, if they want to um, perhaps go into research or academia and that there's lots of really wonderful stuff that happens with other species because they're a little bit further ahead of us um, and they have um, oftentimes a lot more animals to work with so they can do a lot of different types of experiments so um, so i collaborate with a lot of folks here that are not just horse nutritionists but we're really interested right now in um, factors that affect mare milk composition and how that then affects the growing foal. Um, but we've done a lot of work looking at forage digestibility um, and also mineral digestibility and those sorts of things. So um, my my job really is to train graduate students, which I guess become the second or third generation so that they can go out and train other graduate students so that we keep those young scientists coming along whether they end up going into academia or they end up going into the the feed industry we need to keep that pipeline open mm, very well so uh, give us an idea of what state-of-the-art nutrition was when you first uh, began practicing uh, and, uh, and and what are some of the key advancements you've seen over the years yeah so I think um, when I first started, there was a lot of, um, at least the folks that I was involved with, there was a lot of interest in protein nutrition in horses. And there were a lot of studies that have been done there, possibly reflecting the fact that some of the um, nutritionists that transferred over into equine had been swine nutritionists, and that was kind of a hot topic. Um, and so protein was a very uh, popular topic and also amino acids and a little bit on um, non-protein nitrogen. And there was just a little tiny bit of work with the horse's um, microbial community in the large intestine. And really that was sort of a jump off from what they had learned in ruminants. Um, and after that, um, protein for, was popular for a while. And then we sort of moved on to um, energy sources and looking at fat and carbohydrates. And I think that um, that's really changed the feeding practices um, across the world. The diets that horses get now, the commercial feeds that are manufactured now are much different than the ones that were available back in the 1970s and the early 80s. And now today, I think, um, we've we've moved on and uh, in many ways from uh, just thinking about energy sources and now i think there's a lot more interest in sort of functional foods um, and also in thinking about how the diet affects the microbial community and then other things like the sustainability of feeding horses and um, some of those other types of areas joe you're in the innovation business uh, i'm going to ask you the same question what was uh, some of the things that you've seen change over the over the years, and and what role perhaps have you played in some of those uh, new innovations? I, I'm all three of us. I think uh, again are coming through the same time, and so we've all sort of experienced the same changes that we've seen. Um, when I started, it was uh, kind of a, a sweet feed sort of mentality of feeding. They were pretty. Uh, plain straightforward uh, sort of feeding programs about this the time that i was a graduate student steve and and laurie there was this big emphasis put on alternative energy sources particularly fat so we went through that phase of feeding fat for performance horses and that has sort of um, melded into feeding fat to anything that you can catch. Uh, and I think part of the problems that we've got is in in equine nutrition, uh, as is probably in all, all other sectors, uh, sometimes a good idea can be taken to extremes. And we realize that actually we're kind of in the uh, the phase right now of discovering uh, unintended consequences uh, of things that everyone started to apply without giving a whole lot of thought to where they were going. So one of the main things we're studying right now, in fact, is are there some unintended consequences of feeding real high fat diets and the types of fats we're feeding? And if there is, which I would argue there are some problems with that, can we fix it? And so that's one of the things we're trying to do by selectively 
giving different types of polyunsaturated fats to correct some of the imbalances that, that have started. About the time that I started also, or a little, oh, well, about the time that I got into the commercial industry, uh, on the growing horse side, there was a real emphasis on skeletal disorders, osteochondrosis, that sort of thing. And some work at Ohio State suggested that there were some trace minerals that were important. And everybody in the industry set their hair on fire about that, that that was suddenly what caused uh, every problem that there there was. And so everybody went down that rabbit hole for a long time. I think to a certain degree, that's kind of has been litigated and resolved to a certain degree, but we're still looking at, well, what are causing some of these issues? And we're currently trying to do some large field studies, looking at how horses, uh, how their body weight and growth rates may play a role in some of these um, disorders that are unrelated to those specific uh, mineral intakes. So th those are two of the areas that we're interested in. One of the things that I, I think I'm sad about, and I think in conversations with Laurie and Steve that we're all sad about, is that when we first got into this, and Laurie, I remember that was Reno actually in 1985 that you're talking about. Uh, we were all interested in performance horses and high performance horses and how to increase performance. I still am, Steve still is, Laurie still is, because they're both racehorse breeders and owners, and so am I. But the the industry has has gone away from that towards uh, what do we do about the fat horse, the the under exercised horse, the horse. I mean, it's a lot like human society. Horses are getting more obese, and they're having all these metabolic disorders related to that. And I, I just think that's kind of sad when I go to a lot of the scientific meetings now and I see most of the, uh, the research is on those horses as opposed to the horses that we really are interested in that we started with. And that was the, the equine athlete. It's funny that you mentioned that because I, I show hunters and I feel like most of the horses in the, in the hunter show world are grossly overweight. But it seems like that's what uh, what these horse owners want a little bit, a little bit more fat on their horses. So, yeah, I mean, well, sure. I, I was a judge for years, and the class classes of horses that are always too damn fat are halter horses and show hunters, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's it's because that's what the judges prefer is something round. Now, when you go to jumpers and and so on, then it's not as pervasive. But you know, they want them like uh, large, uh, fat horses, and 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 that's one of the things. Sorry, Joe. For I mean, this is a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> I figured it was. <laughs> it, 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 uh, it, it, the thing that that bothers me the most is that instead of, of educating owners about what we're talking about and insulin resistance and so on is that we've we've said oats are poison we haven't because we're nutritionists but people look for quick fixes and drugs to fix this and so i you know i'm i'm 69 i'm close to retirement. I don't have anything to lose. So I'm fairly direct with them and say, look, it's, it's just like you. You need to take ownership of the condition of the horse. You know, people are fat. You know, obesity is the biggest problem we face in the U.S. and humans, and it is in horses. But instead of people uh, teaching consumers, horse owners, how to take uh, control of that. They put them on 18 different drugs. And, you know, you, it, it's, it's easy. You know, Joe and I both kind of worked a lot on energy metabolism when, when we were graduate students. And even when Joe and I were working at KER together, that was one of the things that we really worked on because of our, the proximity to the racehorse business. 
And um, it, it's really simple mathematics for humans and horses. If you eat too damn much, you get fat. If you don't eat enough, you get thin. If you eat the appropriate amount of feed, food, uh, you're in, at maintenance. And, and, and there's no quick fix other than to take control of intake on, on, on horses. Um, and, and we cause a lot of the problems. Humans cause many of the problems that modern horses have because we treat them like a damn Labrador instead of a, an athlete. Not, sorry, I, 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 well, I, I think to, to me, what what illustrates this better than anything is there there was a, a organization that was formed in 1982 called IC. It's the International Conference on Equine Exercise Physiology. And it's when all the, the great thinkers in exercise physiology got together. And every four years they had a conference on advances in equine exercise physiology. This year, they had the, the latest one, and one of the titles, one of the only nutrition talks at that was, the, I may get the title not quite right, but it's something along the lines of judges prefer adiposity in athletic ponies. Now, that was a friggin' <laughs> yeah. Oh, at is, that, is that even an oxymoron? And it's an oxymoron to, be, uh, to boot. Yeah. Uh, it's like, whoa, things have really changed. If that's the science that we're that we have in the our our premier exercise physiology conference is to discover what Steve said he knew a long time ago. Judges prefer fat ponies. Uh, and and hunters, but it, it it's really a sad statement on kind of the priorities right now, and it's it's trying to fix this problem of of fatness, but not by going about the way the sensible way that Steve suggested, um, how to, how to make them thin. But it, but at any rate, you know, we use like ration balancers, and and we've been doing this, Joe's for thirty years. I left in 90, and this is 20, 30 years. We've been using uh, concentrates or, or ration balancers in addition to uh, good quality forage for a lot of horses or, or even in young growing horses where we consider that the, the condition of the horse is excessive. Uh, I'll put them on a kilo a day of a ration balancer or 500 grams uh, so that people satisfied their need to feed uh, without uh, increased caloric intake. No, I think um, from my perspective, so I'm, I'm an academician and I work with a lot of other academicians and I think feeding practices in horses have been um, heavily influenced by feeding practices with other species. And so um, one of the, the things that I, you know, we all have our pet peeves, this is one of mine. And uh, I think that the, the forage specialists in our uh, plant and soil scientists in our university think I'm a heretic because uh, the typical recommendations for pasture management, both the varieties that are selected as well as the management practices have been developed to promote rapid gain in cows and sheep and other grazing animals. And that's not what we want. And it's certainly not what horses that are 15 years old need. So maybe for our listeners, do you think you could give us some examples of a low, moderate, and high performance horse? Yeah. Or I'll horse let, and work. I'll let Joe take that and see uh, if he has some guidelines that he gives to folks. <laughs> well, I mean, in, in the high category, I think racehorses, uh, Laurie's already said, racehorses, uh, advanced three-day event horses, polo ponies, uh, those are horses that are working very hard. In the middle area, there would be other sport horses that are being exercised daily on a regular basis that would be show jumpers, even dressage horses uh, at an upper level. Uh, the low level is the recreational horse. And I think that that's the one that uh, is actually the majority of the horses around. So, you know, Scott, you ask about uh, innovations. One of the things that, that we're working with is the idea of using some technologies that will allow 
horse owners to realize just how little they are riding. Uh, and whether that's cell phone apps, whether it's wearable technology, the sort of thing where you can collect those data and understand how much a horse is really working and then have a nutrition program that fits. Whenever we try to do any sort of uh, nutrition advising to amateur riders, uh, almost every time they overestimate how hard they're working. And so uh, if we give them advice based on that type of, uh, of input, we're gonna get it wrong and we're gonna help make the problem worse. So uh, trying to understand that is, is one of the hardest things uh, for horse owners to, to do. I think the other thing is that we've been schooled um, or we've, we've schooled people that when they're selecting hay, that they should be selecting for high quality hay, which is green and leafy and fresh. And that's all well and good. And that would be great if you were feeding a calf to grow. Um, and it's great if you really do have a high performance horse that needs every calorie they can find. But for the majority of the horses, they don't need that. They need STEMI. Um, and it needs to be clean. It just doesn't need to be that highly nutritious hay. Um, and I think people have a hard time if they look at green and leafy versus kind of average grass hay that's a little bit stemmy and kind of grayish colored. Um, they have a hard time making that choice. But that's that's another thing where we've 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 taught them something that sort of applies to another animal, but not really to the animal that they have. Yeah, I, I agree. One of the things that Laurie is doing and and the people in the agronomy department up there is is emphasizing uh, forage species that are appropriate, uh, not not only as hay, but also as pasture. Um, you know, people think about um, global warming and uh, well, it doesn't affect us and so on. But in central Kentucky, I'm convinced. Uh, that global warning, uh, warming uh, has totally changed uh, what kind of plants are predominant in our pastures. When I came up here in 75, there were pure bluegrass pastures. I mean, that's all, maybe some white clover or something. Uh, now it's more like we have weedy grasses, nimble will, uh, think warm season grasses that are, are, are not appropriate really for for horses uh, and less and less cool season grasses. So it's like the cool cool season grass country um, has moved up some. And so a lot, a lot of the environmental things that we say, see kind of change that. And when, it, when you come to hay, if you go to California, it costs you a lot more money for a bale of Timothy hay than it does a bale of alfalfa hay. And, and I'm a huge alfalfa fan. I mean, on my own farm and on most of my clients, we feed mixed alfalfa orchard grass or straight alfalfa. Uh, you, you just can't feed it full of free choice uh, because it is very calorific. And uh, we've done a poor job uh, actually of talking about forage to, to consumers, uh, you know, and there's a, a, a lot of, uh, wives tales out there in terms of forage species that are incorrect and and believe it or not we just in 45 years we haven't really made a lot of progress in teaching uh, consumers or veterinarians uh, the appropriate things about different forages that make a huge difference you know I've got lots of mares in central Kentucky eating hay and or pasture in a in a, in a supplement pellet uh, uh, and, and they're still too fat. So why do they do that? Well, one of the things is they know I can feed four pounds or four quarts. I mean, a lot of people won't even go to weight. They're still talking about volume uh, and they know what they're feeding. But how do they determine how much forage that they're feeding? And because they don't know, then basically their approach is we're going to meet the requirements with concentrates and, and the grass is gravy. And that's bass backwards from what it should be. Uh, but we just haven't been very effective in general of, of teaching people 
what expected forage intake would be. And, and you know, there are a lot of horses that do hard work that are on forage alone, on the hay alone. In, in California, I have a lot of clients that have cutting horses or roping horses, uh, hard working horses, and they feed them alfalfa cubes and salt, full stop. And they look magnificent, magnificent. So forage ought to be our, our the first thing we talk about to me. Yeah, Steve, you mentioned that we haven't done a very good job of educating people on how to feed their horses. I'm wondering who is we, right? I mean, who's responsible for teaching specifically recreational uh, people that own recreational horses? That seems like a huge task to me. Uh, Lori, is that is that something universities ought to be doing, feed companies? Where, where does that responsibility lie? Well, everybody, and I think um, there's a couple things that are a little bit different about the horse world from the standpoint of um, universities than maybe um, is, is applies to other animals. But um, one of those is that horse owners tend to be pretty transient. So a lot of horse owners may get into the horse industry um, or become a horse owner when they have a child who wants to take lessons and then have a horse, something like that. And then, you know, they're in it for five or six or eight years and then they go out. And so the parents get somewhat educated and then they move on. So it's not necessarily, you know, at, at Steve's level and, and at Joe's level where you've got, you know, high level competition, um, you know, those are, those are more professional level. But here we've got a lot of folks that, you know, come in, they come and they go. They're not like your average beef farmer or sheep farmer. Um, they also don't have an agricultural background necessarily. So they may start owning a horse and not have any idea what the difference is between alfalfa and Timothy Hay. Um, and they're usually not really attached to the cooperative extension service. And so um, in agriculture, people that come from an agricultural background um, are often familiar with their county agent and what those agents can do for them and what the cooperative extension service can do for them. But folks that come from a more suburban environment would never be aware of that. And so that educational pathway, that person that could help them on the ground, sample their hay and provide pasture management, that kind of stuff, um, they don't even know exist. And so um, it's a different sort of thing. And so I think um, some of my extension colleagues would say that they are, they're teaching the same stuff now that they were teaching 15 years ago because it's different people. And so you start out teaching them about forage and by the time they get it, they've left and a whole new crowd has come in. So, um, so it's, a, it's a little bit, it's certainly important. And I think um, at the undergraduate level, uh, many programs do the best they can to um, teach that kind of information. But again, nutrition might be a class that they take um, as opposed to um, something that they would spend a lot of time actually delving into. Lori, while you have the floor, I kind of wanted to dig into another uh, topic, and that's the NRC. I understand that you are the, the chair of the, the NRC that's looking into updating it. Uh, when's the last time that the, uh, the, the equine NRC was updated? Well, the last um, edition was published in 2007. I was chair of that committee that did those updates. Um, once, the, once the new edition is published, the committee is disbanded. And so um, since that time, um, I haven't had any communications with the NRC about that. I did have an inquiry from a person in the feed industry a couple months ago and gave them the name of someone that I thought might have information. But um, one of the, the stumbling blocks for that is that uh, today there's very little internal funding from the National Research Council to update those publications. And so um, you usually have to raise money from the industry. And so um, that is a fairly sizable amount of money because it has to help pay for the staff and the editing and the technical editing and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So it's been a few years. Does it, does it need to be updated? That's that kind of the group. Yeah. I would say there are certainly sections of it that need to be updated. I, you know, I think that there are places in the NRC that probably are need revision. Uh, there's some mistakes, uh, to be real honest, in the NRC that need to be corrected. Um, I think it's still a very useful document. Um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, one of the things that I've told people is that from, from the beginning when I started uh, reading and trying to absorb the NRC, uh, 
requirements, um, every single change that has been made in each of the additions is to increase the horse's requirement for, for nutrients. There has not been a single case where they have said, no, you know, we got this wrong. This is too much. Uh, the requirement should be less. And I think it's human nature, um, both in human nutrition and horse nutrition, to always look for deficiencies or things that we are not doing enough of. In reality, I, I don't think that there is a single place in the NRC that uh, says we need to increase this some because it's deficient. And, and I mean, I study the, 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 the document a, a, a lot, don't I, Laurie? I mean, I'll, I'll call Laurie and say, well, how about the last thing requirement for lactating mares or, or whatever? And, and to be real honest, I mean, I'd love to see it revised, but I can't, from a practical standpoint, read that document and say, yeah, I know this is deficient, we need to increase it. But that's been the nature of the beast is to always... Uh, increase requirements. And then if we take increased requirements and then make a commercial increase as well, uh, so that the feed tag, mine's bigger than yours, uh, then we're, I, in, in the last hundred evaluations I've done, I can't remember every ever seeing a nutrient that I thought was deficient. On the other hand, I don't remember doing one where I thought where I didn't think, man, I, you know, this is way too much of X, Y, Z no, nutrient, you know, wh wh why do we need this much of trace minerals or vitamins and so on? So, uh, you know, I, from, and, and, and I'm, an, I'm a dinosaur. There's no doubt I'm conservative. Uh, I'm like Laurie. I learned basic nutrition from John Baker and applied it. Um, I, I just don't think that if we if all we're going to do is increase the numbers in a new NRC, we don't need it. Is there a better is there a better way to establish uh, requirements uh, other than the NRC? I don't know. I think no. I mean the the, the there there's nothing in the NRC that is toxic, uh, but there, I don't know of anything in the NRC that is. Uh, um, is out of, out of line. So, you know, and that's what makes you angry sometimes is the NRC is the product of a lot of pretty smart people getting together, getting assigned sections to try to make sure that we have the most current research represented uh, in that document. Uh, and then uh, from a commercial standpoint, oh, that's just the minimum. Well, it's not the minimum. For me, it's a, a lot of it's the maximum. Uh, so a lot of it is input from consumers and, and veterinarians and, you know, talking about education, that anything about a horse, anything, the first source of information that people go for is veterinarians. It, except for close clients of Joe's or Laurie's or mine uh, that know that, you know, we're going to give them. And, and I think that we do a... Uh, generally a poor job of educating uh, practitioners on, on nutrition. And there's a, a lot of, you know, knee-jerk reaction in terms of recommendations. And, and so the last year or two, I've, I've tried to make it a point to uh, really get involved in continuing education for practitioners so that, that they have, you know, accurate things to, to say uh, about forage types and about how much feed and about fat and so on, because it's just like doctors, you know, where do you go to doc for information on anything that, uh, uh, associated with health other than your, your doctor. Now he hates to see me come because I'm asking pretty pointed questions, but if the doctor and the vet are the place that people go for information, then we need to, and I know Joe has done this for a long time, get involved with getting information to practitioners that is accurate uh, and, and actually commercially viable. I can kind of jump in there with an example. I was doing a nutrition evaluation for a farm here in town about three years ago, and um, the 
two practicing vet, the two veterinarians that did the um, the work on the farm were in the meeting along with the um, the farm owner and their um, managers. And one of the veterinarians was talking about um, her practice of normally um, giving all the foals that were born um, a shot of selenium. And um, the farm owner asked asked her why she did that. She said, well, because I think that um, the the forage here, the grass here is selenium deficient. And he said to me, he said, is that true? I said, well, it is true that um, our ground here tends to be selenium marginal or selenium deficient. He said, but don't the mares get selenium in their concentrate? And I said, well, yes, they do. Um, but I don't think she knew that. Um, I don't think, you know, that wasn't part of, she didn't put those parts together, you know? So um, I do think that that, and Joe's always really focused on that. I think we need to continue to do that. Although I do think that um, veterinarians are becoming much more interested in nutrition. I get a lot more questions from them than I used to. Yeah, the big, the biggest thing I can see him wanting to get involved to right now is not on even know if I use this, the correct terminology is the, the microbiome or uh, the microbial content of the cecum and large colon and its effect on health. And, you know, we've always said, I think all three of us have always said uh, that the more we learn about feeding horses, the more important we consider the hind gut to be. Uh, and, you know, a healthy hind gut is a result of uh, feed in to, uh, of forage intake and microbial fermentation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like the, the things that are being done now, I think this is the first time ever by anybody has ever known that we have, have uh, a microbiome to consider. And, and when, when I came to Kentucky in 75, Dr. Baker already had uh, my prof professor already had like four or five sequel fistulated horses where they were doing uh, research on the effect of feed intake or type of feeds on on the microbial uh, uh, numeration of, of the hindgut and that was in 75. so it's it's not you know I mean, horses have always had a hindgut and they've always been bacteria there and and it's like oh this is a new deal you need to get this this uh, probiotic or prebiotic and feed it and um, you know, it, it, it's, is we go in cycles, don't we, Joe, we'll, we'll go back, uh, 30 years and, and really there's nothing that's new. Uh, we do have a hell of a lot better analytical techniques that we can use, but it's not like nobody in the past has considered these questions that we continue to ask. Yeah. I thought it was kind of amusing. There was a conference, uh, an animal science conference when they were talking about the equine microbiome and what a discovery it was and i was thinking none of these people have drunk very much beer with peter van seuss back in the in the 80s or the 70s <laughs> because yeah they we kind of already knew that but it, it, to kind of throw in my two cents about the nrc i think there definitely needs to be um a uh considered a uh, review of what advancements have been made in a place where people can can find them and use them. I have not been on an NRC committee, and uh, the reason I haven't is the sort of the structure of the NRC is that it's an academic uh, um, organization. I was asked to be an outside reviewer of the NRC, but because I was commercial, they. Uh, me or Steve or Pat Harris or whoever was not really allowed a seat at the table, which is sort of bizarre, really, because we're the ones who are actually going to end up applying this sort of thing. So I, I think the people that were on the NRC had their hands tied to a certain degree by uh, what evidence they could use and how they could interpret the ev evidence. I would say maybe something that's a little more uh, useful right now that might get a little more funding activity actually rather than a full-blown NRC would be some way that consensus statements could be produced about important topics and if you could get a blue ribbon panel of experts whether they're academic academic or commercial you need a mi mixture of both that can 
review the, uh, the available evidence and put it in the context of what happens in practicality and speak with the united voice about how uh, a specific topic. Part of the problem now, when, uh, when Steve and I uh, were uh, going early in KER, there was no internet. Uh, that's not how information was tra uh, was transmitted. Now you can't get away from the internet, and there's such a, a fire hose of opinions and and misinformation that people have access to. It's kind of hard to to separate that out from what is really true. So I I mean I would wholeheartedly endorse and probably help fund a way that we could create some consensus statements about important topics that aren't even really covered in the NRC except peripherally uh, that people think a lot about. I mean, there's we are obsessed with fat and, and whatnot, but there's not a fat requirement in, a, in the NRC. I mean, in grams per day or grams per day of neutral detergent fiber for that, that matter, you know, things that we have to deal with kind of on an everyday basis. So I, I mean, I think there needs to be uh, a, a way for that information to be um, interpreted and disseminated, but I'm not sure that the NRC is the way these days, the way that we're looking at nutrients. And from a commercial viewpoint, a lot of, well, all, almost always more is better. And that's how you show the, the value of your product is by having more. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's the, the, there is a, a real effort to rethink that. And in fact, the, the uh, PhD that I just hired that, that Laurie trained did all of her work on phosphorus requirements in horses. And I think what she's, her work showed is that we're probably overestimating the amount of phosphorus that's required. It costs a lot of money. And then there's some environmental uh, aspects to what happens to all that phosphorus as well. So I think what you're gonna see is there will be research in the future that looks at those nutrition from a different sort of uh, viewpoint, and that is of overnutrition, because I think that may be more of a problem now in a lot of areas, e either it's calorically or just with some other nutrients that we don't even really understand what this overnutrition is doing. It's not enough to kill a horse, but Laurie, when you're giving a gram and a half of zinc a day to a horse, is that doing anything to its hind gut? You know, what is it doing to the, the bugs that are back there? These are, I think, important things that we need to contemplate and look at the idea, not of black and white binary deficient or excess, but what are acceptable ranges? And at what point are there some unintended consequences that we really haven't got our, our hands on yet. So I think that would be a, a better way to approach some of this in the future. Yeah. I, and I think if in my, in my own, I, I think one of the things that's happened through the pandemic, it, 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 at least from my standpoint, is that uh, because of uh, ingredient cost and uh, diversion of ingredients to uh, making uh, biofuels and so on that that some of the ingredients that we've depended on for a long time are are in less supply and we always you know joe and i both came through the fat era uh, i had graduate students that did work on on fat uh for performance horses and so on so dr steve during um and we thought it was a great idea because it's energy dense, you know, you don't add any starch, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but when fat, uh, a percent fat added 25 to $30 a ton to horse feed, uh, Joe and I had a discussion, what, two months ago, Joe, uh, that maybe we don't need uh, feed, uh, fat in a lot of diets, you know, there are types of fats that are effective in performance horses, but, you know, with, with horses getting too damn fat anyway, I, I took fat out of most of my rations in the last 30 days, uh, because I really couldn't justify the cost of it. And it used to be cheap, you know, so a lot, oats, for instance, you know, they're making 
uh, oat replacement feeds now that have the same nutrient composition as oats, but are not oats, made out of oat feed and so on. And the, the market, you know, we went 30 days ago where most of the sweet feed in, in central Kentucky went up $6 a bag in one fell swoop after having already been increased uh, in March. So you take these big deals, every single one of my clients called, every one of them called me, do I need to do something different? And some of them decided, yeah, you know, it went up, but I'm confident in feeding this way and so on, and they stayed the same. But we went to, a, a lot of farms went to cubes because we're using uh, co-products of the human nutrition things to, to make these feeds. So um, the, the phosphor thing, the phosphorus thing, Scott, I think we talked about the other day, it, in some countries it's already legislated uh, because of environmental and algae bloom and so on. And, and uh, in Europe, they're very, very particular about runoff of nutrients from, from farms and a lot of the big uh, places have places that they can uh, uh, put waste and let it, it, it and not run off into the, the creeks and streams. So all of these things are, you know, that it, it kind of goes along with the, the, there are a lot of people, a lot of my friends from Texas that say um, global warming is bullshit. You know, it, it, you know, it's just a political thing. And then all of a sudden, 30 years later, we, you find out that a lot of these things that we're doing environmentally are very, very negative. Uh, and that includes overfeeding animals or inappropriate nutrient concentrations in animal feed that we just, we really need to consider. You know, we're getting pretty close to done here, but there's one area I wanted to kind of dig into before we depart. And, and that is, uh, you know, Steve, before you said there's not a lot new, there is one thing that is new and that's epigenetics. Um, some recent research that Balcom sponsored at a couple of your uh, alma maters, uh, Cornell, and this was done with humans, they actually supplemented choline um, to, to mothers uh, during gestation. Um, and then with, with, the, with the objective of um, improving cognitive function and development, and then they measured the, the mental acuity or focus of those children as infants, and they came back seven years later and measured uh, their ability to focus then at seven years old. And they found that the children uh, whose mothers were supplemented with additional choline ha had a significant amount of uh, better focus than, than the children whose mothers did not. And, and I'm wondering, um, is there a role for something like that, a research, Lori, uh, looking at that um, in, in equine, right? Improving the ability, the trainability, uh, of, of horses and just kind of curious if you guys have given anything like that any thought. Well actually uh, the folks down at the University of Florida have done some experiments back um, looking at um, omega-3 fatty acids and then in feeding the mares and then looking at some of the um, trainability characteristics of the foals. I don't know that um, they have, were able to make a strong conclusion. Of course one of the huge issues is having large enough populations that you can actually see differences, you know, because the differences are not likely to be, uh, or our ability to detect the differences in horses are not likely to be huge, right? So um, I don't know, uh, I think it's a really interesting thing. And certainly um, what Steve was just talking about and Joe earlier, we've been probably over supplementing broodmares for a long time with many different types of um, trace minerals. And whether those things have an effect on um, the foals over time, I don't know. I wonder, I look at all these horses that have insulin resistance, some of them not even apparently overweight, but they're insulin dysregulated. Um, they're 10 years old or eight years old. And I think, how can that even be, you know? And, and so I think, uh, maybe it's a multi-generational type of thing that we just haven't really recognized. Yeah, it, it, it's a, it's a complex thing and it's difficult. And, um, unfortunately I, I, I'm not as involved going to every scientific meeting, but you know, most of my 
colleagues uh, are my same age, are, are very, very close. And I don't see a hell of a lot of a uh, new generation of Joe Pagans and Laurie Lawrence's. It's probably good there's not another generation of Steve Jackson's, but uh, you know, it, it, where, where, is the, where is the next group of like gurus uh, coming from? I don't know. Well, I, I think that's a, a great place to maybe stop uh, for all those uh, and young students out there listening. There's a need in equine nutrition. So uh, I would, uh, I don't know who to call. Call Lori, I guess. Uh, there, there's a need out there. Call. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you guys just noticed, but they flickered the lights. That means it is last call. I'm almost out of beer, so I think we'll call it quits there. But uh, before we do, I'd like to, to ask each of you to kind of give us, uh, you know, one, two, three uh, key takeaways from our conversation this afternoon for the audience. And uh, Steve, why don't we start with you? All right. Um, don't overfeed. Uh, you know, make sure that you know the body condition that is appropriate for the horse that you're using and feed him uh, due to that. You know, is your basic uh, should be common sense nutrition is the body condition is first. And then you can fluctuate on how you get the trace minerals and so on uh, in there. Uh, if it's nutritionist, you know, tell people the truth, you know, it, it, make sure that they understand the, the actual function of the horse's GI tract and how important forage is. I, it, you know, I'm, I have been for a long time, but particularly now a forage fan. And I think there are a lot of old wives tales that, that need to be dispelled in terms of what forage species are appropriate for horses. Carrie, what comments do you have for us? Well, I think as a, uh, a horse owner myself, uh, listening to this conversation, um, you know, there's so much information on the internet, right? Good, bad, ugly. So do your research and seek help from somebody who knows what they're talking about, right? Not just another horse owner on the internet, you know, go to a nutritionist and, and, I guess your vet to uh, encourage them to uh, learn or go to a nutritionist as well. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. And Lori, what kind of final comments do you have for us? Yeah, I, I thought what Steve said was good. I think um, as nutritionists, we all need to probably do a better job of educating um, the people who actually advise horse owners. So whether those are veterinarians or farriers or horse trainers, um, people at the lesson barn, you know, that's the, that's where incoming horse owners get their information and recreational horse owners get their information. Um, and I think we have a lot of, we have plenty of information to solve probably 80% of the problems in the recreational horse industry relative to nutrition. Maybe not the growing horse, maybe not the performance horse, but I think um, if we just apply what we know, um, we could probably, and put it into practice, we could probably um, do a better job of feeding those horses. All right, thank you for that, Lori. And Joe, we'll give you the final words. Well, I'd, I think it's an exciting time because there's a lot of new technologies that can be used to answer some questions that we've had for a long time. I So, you know, full steam ahead on that, but also use co use some caution in uh, interpreting and uh, applying some of this because there are unforeseen uh, circumstances that we really need to pay attention to. So I think there there. We will make strides, but we need to be careful about how we use this technology. Joe, Lori, Steve, Carrie, first, let me thank you for the enlightening conversation tonight. The equine segment is new to me, and so I've really enjoyed uh, getting to learn more about the intricacies of feeding these amazing athletes. Uh, to our loyal listeners, uh, 
And to those new to the exchange, I want to thank you for coming along with us. We've covered a, a lot of ground over the last couple of years, and I'd encourage you to go uh, out to either our website or to your favorite podcast platform and, and take a look at some of the past episodes that we've had. There's a lot of good information out there. Um, also, if you've got any ideas for other topics uh, that you'd like us to, to discuss, please reach out to us uh, with those ideas at anh.marketing at about. Uh, at balkim.com and we'd like to work with you to bring those to the pub and you never know maybe we'll invite you to join us as well uh, but for now i want to thank everybody for joining us uh, we hope you learned something we hope you had some fun and we hope to see you next time here at the real science exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends we'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests so please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash realscience to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.